There is an inherent sense of safety and security that comes with small town life. A sense that nothing bad can happen when the population is below a certain number, where people seem to know everyone, either from the small size of the town, through marriage and family, through school, or all of these reasons. That sense of safety and security is why many choose to leave crime-ridden metropolitan areas. They want to protect themselves and their families from the dregs of society, to have less headaches from traffic, shorter lines at the grocery store, friendlier neighbors, and just an overall feeling of quiet. The last thing anyone moving to or living in a small town expects are bombings, threats, theft, witness intimidation, and murder. These are crimes that happen in big cities because that's where those type of criminals exist. In the late 1960s, the small town of Tahlequah, Oklahoma found out that, in fact, big city crime could penetrate the walls of safety and security. And it wasn't because a group of seasoned criminals relocated to this northeastern Oklahoma town. It was only one man and he brought a level of crime that most residents had only seen on the big screen. The city of Tahlequah, Oklahoma was established in 1839 as the capital of the Cherokee Nation after the tribe's forced removal from its native lands in the southeast. Since then, Tahlequah has grown to roughly 17,000 people and is the county seat for Cherokee County. Over the last two decades, Tahlequah has had a renewal, adding parks, festivals, including the award-winning Red Fern Festival, major renovations to the city hospital, new homes, new neighborhoods, new businesses, and a revitalization of its historic downtown with an eye on progress and art, but keeping it a little retro at the same time. The Cherokee Nation has done its part by adding a casino complete with a golf course, several museums and cultural centers, and a multi-million dollar hospital to name a few. The renowned campus of Northeastern State University is located just north of downtown. Northeastern State University adds that college town feel and provides a major source of employment for the city. Tahlequah is also known as a tourist town. The Illinois River and Lake Tenkiller attract a bevy of tourists year after year. Lake Tenkiller found fame as the setting for the 1986 slasher film, Terror at Tenkiller. The Illinois River and Tahlequah itself are prominent in Wilson Rawls' 1961 book and the 1974 film adaptation, Where the Red Fern Grows. Tahlequah is home to many national and regional touring musicians, including Red Dirt music legend Randy Crouch and several members of the Turnpike Troubadours. Famed actor Wes Sooty hails from Tahlequah and frequently visits. For a time, Tahlequah was the fictitious home office for The Late Show with David Letterman. Considering the economic growth, improvements to infrastructure and quality of life investments, Tahlequah is a municipality determined to reach its zenith. This is a far cry from life in Tahlequah in the 1960s. Not that it was a town in ruin, just smaller, quieter, and perfectly content with it. Tahlequah was a pleasant little town. Well, of course, I grew up in Tahlequah. I was born in Tahlequah at the Tahlequah City Hospital, which is uh, now the, the uh, Cherokee County District Courthouse. In the 50s uh, and early 60s, I would say that Tahlequah was uh, a really nice town uh, to raise your family in. I was born in Tahlequah in the early 1960s. And it was a time when, when Tahlequah was a, a quiet, calm, well-behaved, safe place to live. Tahlequah was a wonderful place to live. We had uh, Northeastern State College with college students. President Vaughn is 
president and we enjoyed the college students. Our public school system was wonderful. I was the teacher and we were planning for new buildings and our children came from all over town from every walk of life and the parents were very interested in the education of the town. It didn't take much of an excuse to have a parade. There were cars, there were horses, there were walkers, there were floats, and the children ran along the side of the parade. You were not afraid that somebody was going to be run over. The businesses in town sponsored uh, any of the of the expenditure, and there was a chamber of commerce. I can't remember much about what the chamber did uh, about the parades, but the entities of the town worked together. And I can remember as a young teacher in the old armory building, which is now the city of Tahlequah's uh, armory annex, floats were uh, put in there to be decorated for the parade. And as a um, young teacher, one of my duties was to help do the float for one of the elementary schools, Sequoia Elementary School. I never wadded up and put as much um, paper, napkins, paper napkins in chicken wire in my life to make a really fancy float. Back then, uh, we didn't lock our cars. We didn't lock our doors. Uh, people uh, at home, when we'd go to sleep at night, the, the doors would not be locked or anything of that nature. It was uh, kind of what I would consider to be a, a peaceful, a very peaceful community. Well, it's generally been a fairly a peaceful county, and, except for the old days. In the late 1920s and through the 1930s, Tahlequah experienced a wave of crime primarily due to the Great Depression and Prohibition. The Dust Bowl years didn't help the state of Oklahoma either. The seclusion of the Cookson Hills in Cherokee County and several rural families willing to help gave outlaws and bootleggers a haven to run to or set up shop in. These volatile years produced a lawman that was unrelenting in his pursuit of these outlaws. Sheriff Grover Bishop, who is rumored to have killed as many as 17 criminals during his time in office, put fear in the minds of outlaws and bootleggers. September of 1932 was perhaps the bloodiest month in Cherokee County history, with a total of eight people being killed during a multi-week manhunt. Tahlequah, in the middle 40s, was a calm town. Previous to that time, with the Depression era and uh, the war, uh, those were the days of uh, Grover Bishop, who was sheriff for many years, of bootleggers who were selling hooch for many reasons, uh, sometimes to make a living, sometimes for other reasons. After the period of calm uh, at the end of uh, World War II, then suddenly we saw uh, the Vietnam War, civil unrest, protests on campuses. Little did I know until I was older of the events that had taken place during my my lifetime during the, the 1960s, beginning with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassination of President Kennedy, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, all of the events of Vietnam, the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., of Bobby Kennedy, uh, the four students that were killed at Kent State University by the National Guard in Ohio. I, unfortunately, felt that this was normal in America, that the rest of my life would be uh, punctuated with, with assassinations and, and wars and unpopular uh, anti-government and uh, demonstrations and, and tensions and racial tensions and demonstrations and killing. Then Rex Brindley came to town and we found out that the worst was yet to come.
Over the years, Brindley earned a reputation for criminal activity with rumored ties to organized crime. Brindley once wrapped up an impromptu interview with a reporter by describing himself as individualistic in his lifestyle and business. I'm like a rattlesnake. I won't come looking to bother you, but if you bother me, you'll hear my rattles. Born Garland Rexford Brindley Jr., December 23, 1933, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to Garland Sr. and Betty Brindley. Rex's uh, upbringing, um, middle class, uh, typical Oklahoma, um, his mother uh, described him as a bad seed, uh, which was, I thought, was an interesting choice of words because uh, the seed uh, is from which everything grows from. And obviously, I think she intuitively knew that uh, he, there was something not quite wired right uh, to follow a true moral compass. And uh, I think she conveyed that uh, to the people in, uh, that, she, that interviewed her and uh, in statements in public. But I, I think she loved her son, but knew that uh, he probably would struggle in life. Brindley's niece, Carrie, has a different story than what was printed in regards to Brindley's early years. He um, had an alcoholic father. My, gra my grandfather, Rex Sr., um, died pretty young. He was in his 50s from a heart attack. And I believe it was from all the drinking he did. I, I'm sure that uh, at a young age, Rex did not have a lot of um, parenting. And he was actually raised by my grandfather, but my dad ran away from home and was raised by another family. And I believe that's why my father um, was such a good man. In an interview with James Johnson of the Oklahoman, Brindley claims to have dropped out of Tulsa's East Central High School at 15 to work as a plumber. Additionally, records show that he and his father operated a liquor store in Tulsa called Rex's Liquor Store. As a matter of fact, when he came to Tahlequah, he already had a short criminal record. He'd been, he'd been a grocer and a plumber. Brindley claimed to have had the third largest plumbing business in Oklahoma. Whether that was true or not, Brindley did have the finances to purchase a 740-acre ranch near Chelsea, Oklahoma, located in Mays County, and a Cessna airplane. The earliest memory I have of Rex would be um, at his ranch, and I was pretty young at that time. I don't really remember what age I was, but uh, he I remember the house. I remember visiting and he had an airplane. It was around this time that Brindley's brushes with law enforcement began. And it was just hearsay that I'd heard he'd, he'd fly, you know, a small plane and, and spot cattle. And he would go and scout uh, uh, cattle to uh, load up at night with his men in uh, various county vehicles or farm equipment from other farmers and ranchers and uh, uh, take them apart and wind up in his barn. And of course, he would always say that he uh, had no recollection of or know how they got there. And they discovered some stolen cattle on his ranch. In 1965, he was convicted of uh, rustling cattle and uh, offenses of that nature over in Mays County. He got three years in prison for it, but he hired some high-powered lawyers. They appealed the case, and he ended up um, beating it. And uh, the Court of Appeals reversed the conviction. Actually, on a, what some people would call a technicality, as a former teacher of criminal justice, I can tell you, if you have rural property and they and you have something, uh, people can walk on it. And, and it's open fields doctrine. If they get too close to your house, on the other hand, and they discover criminality, that, that case pretty much sets out that the evidence can be suppressed. So he ended up winning that case. He had, he had some important attorneys. They represented some uh, important people in Oklahoma as far as the, the criminal scene is concerned. And after he won it, he became a little bit of a folk hero in certain circles. 
A brazen Brindley called attention to his illegal activities by wearing a leather belt and printed with Mays County Flying Bandit. Shortly after the dismissal of the first set of charges, Brindley was charged in five counties with cattle rustling and possession of stolen property. Eventually, these charges were dropped for a lack of evidence. Once again, his top-tier legal team scooped Brindley out of the fire. A sense of legal invincibility began to take root in Brindley's mind. It appears that Rex decided that he was going to use, to get what he wanted in life, he was going to use um, anything, any tactic he could. He, he was above the law. He was going to get what he wanted if he had to kill for it. As wore on, the nation's attention was focused on the escalating anti-war and racially motivated violence plaguing cities nationwide, the perceived dangers of rock and roll and the illicit drug use that seemed to follow it. In Cherokee County, locals had noticed the arrival of a brash businessman named Rex Brindley. He was quoted as saying, I got the idea of going to Tahlequah while the cattle thing was going on. They needed housing for students at Northeastern State College. So I went there and put up a 38-room apartment house. Brindley also opened a tavern and steakhouse that he used as a base of operations. With top quality steaks at the lowest price, locals were quickly drawn to the restaurant and tavern. I didn't know anything about that much about him at the time. Just that it was a man that uh, wasn't from this area that uh, opened up a business. And uh, uh, we would frequent that business from time to time. I remember meeting Rex Brindley for the first time at his steakhouse, the Hereford Steakhouse, just north of Tahlequah. My dad had uh, taken me out there to work with him, uh, who worked for Rex at the steakhouse as uh, the chef uh, ran the kitchen. And I was sitting there eating a salad uh, with blue cheese dressing. And he walked up to me and looked at me and I thought, he's wondering if I paid for this salad. And uh, I don't know why I even thought that, or even why that I still feel that today. But um, my dad came up and beside me, and Rex kind of smiled that half arrogant, cocky smile that he <laughs> always had, and uh, kind of nodded his head and, uh, and, and, and went on. But I, I still remember that incident. You could hear him. He was loud. He was a braggart. He was a real smart aleck most of the time. Had a bad attitude if somebody crossed him or... I mean, he is smart mouth. He was involved in quite a few uh, fights at the bar. He loved to ridicule somebody. And I mean, it wasn't playful ridicule either, you know. It didn't take too much to get him uh, into a fight. He was tough. He was short, heavy set, stout, and like a little bull. Some drunk would raise heck with him, and I mean, the fight would be on. And he usually come out as the winner. He didn't seemed like a man that you ever wanted to really cross. And, and as a young child, uh, I think children know uh, who they can instinctively trust and need to be cautious around. And Rex certainly was one of those people that I was always cautious around. And that was the way he was. He was not shy about being a, a, a tough guy. My dad also, I think, was wise in not involving uh, the rest of my family with him. Uh, I can't ever remember you know, any of my siblings ever, you know, being around him and uh, or my mother. My first encounter with Rex Brindley, uh, my wife and I had heard that he served real good steaks out at his restaurant in North Town. One of his specials on his menu was the Rustler Special. Uh, I think it was aptly named the Rustler Special. 
And I can remember us on Sunday, sometimes we would go out to eat because it was the cheapest steak in town. And uh, <laughs> if you're rustling cattle, that I see the reason that he was able to sell those steaks for so cheap. And they were good steaks. That was kind of putting it back in everybody's face. It didn't take long for Brindley to come into conflict with several established local business owners, mainly due to his get out of my way or else attitude. Rex's entanglements with local businessmen, I remember one uh, with Jim McSpadden. Jim owned a uh, propane company here in town, and he had some very large propane tanks just south of the restaurant. And, uh, and of course, uh, Rex had a, uh, a propane tank uh, that belonged to Jim and provided a uh, propane to Rex. And occasionally uh, Rex would get behind on his uh, payments for propane and he would uh, bring uh, Jim large quantities of fresh ground hamburger meat as a down payment and, and, and a, a good faith effort, uh, which Jim uh, graciously uh, accepted. Until one day he was driving by the restaurant and found Rex out there by his propane tank with a competitor's uh, truck loading, uh, pumping propane into his tank. He called uh, Rex up and said, we can't do that. And he said, well, Jim, I've often wondered what a couple of sticks of dynamite would do to uh, uh, some large propane tanks. I'd kind of like to see that kind of explosion. Uh, Jim told Rex that uh, he said, uh, I think everything's fine, and I'll talk to you later. And hung up the phone. Not everyone that encountered Brindley were immediately put off by his manner, because not everyone was on the side of the law, or at least not a full-blown Boy Scout. Brindley loved to brag, but some criminal acts he participated in could not be retold in glorious detail to just anyone. Only criminal associates could be privy to those stories. Of course, knowing too much about the nefarious activities of Brindley could put an individual at the top of his hit list. So, I'm working for this guy. He uh, has a lot of varied interests. Shopping centers, western store, salvage yard, legitimate and unlegitimate businesses. I'm sitting here one day, and they introduced me to this fella. It was Rex. Really, I had briefly met him whilst in college at the squeeze in. We started talking, introduced me to him. He was, uh, it was funny because he was driving a big old Chevy Impala. I had no gal with him. She, uh, I, I, I can't actually remember her name. I want to say Annie, Maggie, something. But uh, they pulled up to the office. What we done was uh, rebuild cars. Little did I know we was getting all our parts from a chop shop. In t yeah, there in Tulsa. And so he comes. They said, come here and look at this. Well, I, instantly I noticed this big car and the front end looks like it's sticking in the air. And he goes back, opens the trunk up, and I never seen so much silver in my life. 
You couldn't have put another quarter in that trunk. If you do Rex with a little loose mouth, they didn't mind telling you some of the stuff he done. He'd been out at a bragging to us to California, knocking off uh, parking meters, sledgehammers, and they'd knock them off and take all the change out and put it in. The, and they come back and they knew this millionaire buddy that I had. He knew that he was paying 75 cents on the dollar for everything that he had. So we're sitting around, starts telling me a story. They uh, went to Muskogee, bought sheets of copper. They, they knew how much his quarter weighed. They didn't have weights back then. So they used like a, a Librium and put a quarter on one side and balanced it and found out how much it weighed. Bought copper because it was the same density as the quarters. I don't know how many sheets he bought. He told me a couple. And they spent all day out at Cookson making quarters out of this copper. And they took him to Las Vegas. That was back when the mob run the show out there. Las Vegas in those days was run primarily by the Chicago Mafia, AKA the Outfit. Other Italian crime families in several cities also had a piece of what was known as the Vegas skim, but the Chicago family supplied the muscle and took the lion's share. At this time, the outfit boss was Joey Iupa, considered one of the toughest bosses in that city's history. Even the most vicious mobsters were intimidated by his iron-fisted manner of leadership. Tony the Ant Spilatro was dispatched by the outfit to oversee the entire Vegas operation. With famed Jewish bookmaker Frank Lefty Rosenthal running the casinos. Spilatro was one of the outfit's most gruesome enforcers, having put a man's head in a vice which caused the man's eyeballs to pop out of the sockets. Both Spilatro and Rosenthal were made famous in Martin Scorsese's 1995 film Casino. Joe Pesci portrayed Spilatro, and Robert De Niro starred as the Rosenthal character. Needless to say, neither of these individuals possessed anything resembling tolerance when it came to stealing from them. You didn't rob the mob and simply get a slap on the wrist. Brindley was fully aware of this fact. He knew that a hole in the desert would be his final destination if he were caught trying to put one over on the powers that be. When they turned in Nevada, there's a little town called Bullhead City. And there's another little town called Henderson. First, they hit them with them slugs on the way to Vegas. Went to Vegas and played them slugs until the slot machines was paying out in slugs. He didn't know why he didn't get killed. Brindley's next business move was rental property. His 38-unit apartment building on Tremble Street in Tahlequah enabled Brindley the means to tap the wallets of students attending Northeastern State College by providing them off-campus housing. Business was moving along just fine until college president Vaughn weighed in on the prospect of his students residing there. 
May and we was just, in, it was in the fall. Uh, we was rushing to get the apartments completed for the fall term for Northeastern University. And he stopped in there one day and said, can I talk to you? And I said, sure, Rex, what do you need? He said, can I measure you your room? I said, yeah, I don't have no problem with it. And he said, well, I said, why? He said, well, I built a block apartment complex on uh, North Trimble Street in Tahlequah. And that blankety blank uh, president of the university says that my rooms aren't big enough and he won't let the students uh, live in my apartment. So I said, well, measure he, he got out his tape and he'd done his business and we visited for a while just to even measure around. Finally, he's ready to leave. I'll never forget the exact words he said. He's still cussing under his breath to the president of the university. He said, for $500, I can make one call to Kansas City and have that SB blown up as he walked out the door. Kansas City was a place Brindley would mention on many occasions when it came to needing a problem individual eliminated by means of explosives. La Cosa Nostra, mob, and mafia were terms whispered by many in Tahlequah when it came to Brindley and his criminal connections and possible membership in said criminal organizations. Everybody here, you know, had seen movies and, and uh, things, and I don't think he wasn't in organized crime himself, he might have been trying to organize crime, but he wasn't in like the Mafia or the Costa Nostra because they kind of like keep pro low profile. Rex kind of like to uh, be out in the limelight, you know? And he, he people here kind of thought he might have been in some type of organized crime. I really don't think he was. He kind of organized his own criminal enterprises, I think. However, there is no way Brindley could have been a made member of any Italian organized crime family due to him not being 100% Italian or Italian at all. At best, he could have been an associate. Associates are allowed to do work and earn for a crime family, assuming their schemes and activities are approved by the crime family. Associates are at the bottom of the mafia hierarchy. Associates are usually a part of a specific crew headed by a capo regime or capo and usually live in the area the crime family or crew operate out of. But Brindley wasn't a resident of Kansas City. The boss of the KC mob in these years was Nick Savella, a position he would hold until his death in March of 1983 at the Federal Prison Medical Facility in Springfield, Missouri. For the most part, the New York Mafia families avoided using bombs. Too many innocent people can be killed or hurt and it brings too much heat from law enforcement. However, the Kansas City crime family did use bombs from time to time. So the idea that Rex could have had a relationship with a mob-connected bomb expert doesn't seem too far-fetched. But no concrete evidence was ever presented in a court of law that absolutely linked Brindley and the Kansas City Mafia. With the issues presented by President Vaughn in the rearview mirror, the apartments were consistently full and became known as the place where some of the best parties were thrown. Those Northeastern students liked their landlord. He was uh, gruff, he was tough, and he was young. Really, he was only 32 years old when he came to Tahlequah. So they identified with him. Yet not every resident or their guest received Rex the cool landlord experience while at Trimble Street Apartments. My first recollection of Rex Brindley was when my grandfather, who uh, lived uh, uh, north of Tahlequah at that time, uh, out on Cedar Road, uh, I came over to help him uh, work with the cattle and, and things, and I pulled up into the driveway, and I saw Grandpa out in the field with, a, with another gentleman. I didn't know who the gentleman was at the time. And uh, I saw Grandpa coming back towards me, uh, and I could tell he was upset. And I said, Grandpa, what's, what's wrong? And he says, I said, I'm going to call the sheriff. And I said, why? And he says, well, I, I priced my brush hog to this man for $200. And this man told me I was selling it to him for 100 And I said, so what, what happened then? He says, well, I told him, no, it was for 200 And he says, no, you're going to sell it to me for 100 And he says, he kept on arguing with me. So I just told him that he had until I got to the house to get off of the property or I was calling the sheriff. And he says, that's where I'm headed. 
And I said, who is he, Grandpa? And he says, Rex Brindley. So then I went to proceed to tell Grandpa about a few nights before that I had been over at this apartment complex in Tahlequah where Rex Brindley uh, had those apartments. And uh, I was a Phi Lam, a Dakai, and they were having a fraternity party, and I was up on the second floor of those apartments. And I remember hearing a big commotion out in front and hearing people screaming and yelling, and, and it was easy to see the people had circled up and that there was some kind of a fight going on. And uh, I, about the time I got out there, uh, the, they were taking the boy that was hurt off to the hospital, which is up here where the uh, courthouse is at this time. And I asked what had happened, and they said that Rex had got this young man down on the ground and that he had stuck his thumb in behind his eye and knocked, pulled his eye out of his socket and they were taking him to the hospital to try to save his eye. So I told Grandpa, I said, Grandpa, this guy is a mean man. He is somebody that we don't want to mess with. He's, uh, he says, I don't care. He's not going to steal my, my brush hog. He says, I'm calling the sheriff. And sure enough, Grandpa got to the house and I saw that guy load up and, uh, and recognized him then as Rex Brindley and he was pulling, it, pulling out of Grandpa's driveway. But that was my first time to really know who Rex Brindley was. Nineteen sixty six started out as docile as previous years had. But as the year progressed, citizens realized Tahlequah was becoming a different town. Dubbed the Mystery Bomber by the pictorial press, this villain, or possibly group of villains, delivered a series of bombings that shocked and terrified the citizens of Tahlequah and Cherokee County. For most citizens, these bombings came out of nowhere. But for those familiar with Rex Brindley, it seemed like the inevitable had finally arrived. In the mid to late 60s, the newspaper owner, Ted Reisenhoover, had come to town, bought the Pictorial Press, which is now the Tahlequah Daily Press. And uh, he believed that uh, organized crime was rampant and he was going to expose it. And uh, his newspaper ended up being bombed. And that was uh, credited to um, either Rex Brindley or a group that was being investigated by a federal grand jury. And that was what later became known as the Dixie Mafia. The Dixie Mafia, not Italians or uh, Cosa Nostra, but uh, a fairly well-organized uh, group of Southerners, white Southern men and a few women, who um, resorted to uh, murder to enforce their uh, code, murder of each other, it turns out, uh, more than anybody else. But in the late 60s, there were murders, uh, armed robberies, home invasions, uh, grand larcenies, and um, they were attributed to a group that was headquartered, for lack of a better word, in Biloxi, Mississippi. Now, I was stationed there in 1966 at an Air Force base, Keesler. In 1965, an Oklahoman was stationed there by the name of Kirksey Nix, Jr., who was in the Oklahoma Air National Guard. His, he was from a wealthy family or an important family. His father was a justice on the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals. After his parents divorced, his mother married into the Kerr family. And so uh, he had access to funds. And <clears throat> he thought that he could probably buy himself out of any trouble that he got into. At any rate, that was the big Oklahoma connection. Uh, and they were being investigated at the same time all these bombs were going off in Oklahoma. Just two months later, a club near the Cherokee County line was bombed, followed by another bombing in March of 1967. Things were spiraling out of control, and local law enforcement wasn't equipped to handle crime of this level. One night in December of 1967, the mystery bomber went further than anyone could imagine by bombing three bars in one night in one hour. 
it was always after midnight. I lived in Boonot, area of Boonot, uh, just uh, on the old Highway 62, which is just kind of, it lives just a little bit south of Speedy Station now on the east on the highway. And I was awakened, I believe it was possibly around 2, 2.30 in the morning, and a loud explosion to the east of me. Woke us up. <clears throat> A little bit, we go back to sleep, and we'll lay back to bed. Had another one to the west of us, this time towards the river. And then a few minutes later, I had a third one, which was at the edge of the town hall on the east side. I never really heard about Rex being involved. I heard that uh, the wholesaler for alcohol that these three places wasn't uh, buying from him. Earlier in the evening, Lawrence Fishing Hawk received a phone call that not only saved his life, but absolutely implicates a certain Tahlequah tavern owner. I went back to college, went to work at a bar. Uh, we had a uh, beer bus one night a week. I was the front man at the gate taking the money for the owner of the bar. Then that night we were having the beer bus. I get a phone call and tells me to call in sick that I couldn't work that night. I had no idea what the deal was, but I knew who it was. I was supposed to call him sick. He saved my life, and he probably made another call or two. I think because I was young and the relationship we had, he didn't want me to get hurt. And I never knew the man to the heart to have a conscience. At this point, the few citizens of Tahlequah that hadn't heard the name Rex Brindley soon became very aware of him. His past, his tendency to threaten anyone he felt crossed him, the violent acts he was capable of, and that he had a knack for dodging prison cells. It was crystal clear Tahlequah was becoming a twisted, dangerous version of its former self. With the mounting fear and frustration of the public regarding Brindley's intimidation tactics and perceived guilt in the recent bombings, as well as law enforcement's inability to nail down charges that would put him away, the public felt Brindley would continue his reign of terror unfettered. Fortunately, a lawman arose to take on Brindley in a fearless quest to end the recent wave of unprecedented crime. Bill Bliss, an assistant district attorney and resident of Tahlequah, became Tahlequah's best chance at justice finding Brindley. And the thing that I remember best about Bill Bliss was is that he was became more of a mentor for me, and so I had a lot of respect for, uh, for Bill Bliss. Known as fearless and fair, Bliss was not about to watch his hometown become a place of fear and violence. He launched a series of raids on Brindley's bars and Brindley himself. He sent Brindley a clear message that Tahlequah was sick and tired of him. He uh, wore a white hat. He let everybody know that he was going to clean up the, some dirty business in town. One night when he and his family were at dinner, in comes Rex Brindley into the house right up here on Downing Street or uh, one of those streets up there by the high school. And he was bodily wrestled and thrown out of the house by Assistant District Attorney Bliss. Well, uh, I don't believe there was a prosecution for that, and I've always kind of wondered why it wouldn't be that Bill Bliss was afraid to testify against him, but he did have threats against him, and not only that, 
After the threat, someone put a bomb in Assistant District Attorney Bliss's pickup. Uh, I had worked a personal injury accident uh, and I came back into town to the old Indian hospital up by the college. And whenever I got my information, I left there and dropped off on uh, College Street and went south on it. By the time I got up by the library, I heard a humongous explosion. So I picked up my county radio and hollered at the uh, police department and uh, asked them to go, or I told them to go check the junior high out and I'd run up the high school, see if I could find the location of that explosion. And I kept driving there and uh, went by Bill Bliss's residence, who was the assistant DA at the time. And uh, his wife, Joyce, and his little boy, Billy, were standing out on the front porch just screaming. So I pull into the driveway and there's Bill Bliss, uh, about half in and half out of the truck, and it was damaged. And so I pulled him out of the truck, laid him on the driveway, and hollered at Joyce. I finally got her attention to run into the house and get me some rags, towels, anything. And uh, she finally brought him back out to me, and I pushed his intestines back into his body, tried to stop the bleeding and uh, got a hold of the ambulance and called my headquarters and got a hold of the OSB high. And, uh, you know, Bill had, had gotten hit a lot of uh, stomach injuries with that bombing. He'd lost a finger in that bombing, and it was uh, he was so lucky to have him survive. Although arrested for the bombing, Brindley was later released to the dismay of the public. Yet Bliss, laid up in the hospital, recovering from wounds that would bother him the rest of his life, wouldn't back off his pursuit of Brindley. The citizens of Tahlequah were of the opinion that Bill Bliss was one tough son of a bitch. Bill's father, Judge June Bliss, concerned about his son's safety at Tahlequah City Hospital, called upon a legendary lawman and personal friend to guard his son's hospital room. Former Sheriff Grover Bishop loaded up for one last assignment. No one, not even Rex Brindley, had the nerve to attack anyone under Bishop's personal protection. Bliss was later released from the hospital and safely returned home. Founded in 1898 and situated between Tulsa and Oklahoma City on Interstate 44, the city of Bristow, Oklahoma is a community of around 5,000 people. Bristow, like Tahlequah, is in the midst of a renaissance, adding murals, new businesses, and improvements to public amenities. Bristow today is a growing community. We've got a lot of coals in the fire right now, uh, finishing up a new airport uh, facility. Uh, we're building a new swimming pool, water park. We're building a new hospital. Uh, we're building new hotels, and uh, we're getting, uh, through the help of the county and the Turnpike Authority, we're getting ready to have a big exchange uh, on and off ramps done out here with service roads. And economic development is growing, and. Uh, Bristol's on a road to uh, growth right now, and uh, we've got a lot of, like I say, we've got a lot of coals in the fire. Another similarity between Bristow and Tahlequah was the general outlook and pace of life throughout most of the 1960s. Small, unassuming, quiet, and small town safe. Unfortunately, Bristow, like Tahlequah, bears the scars of Rex Brindley's nefarious actions. What happened on the morning of February 2nd, 1971, 
changed the lives of many in both towns. The citizens of Bristow were privy to a dose of the big city crime Tahlequah had been struggling with, which resulted in a young, well-respected family falling victim to the remorseless evil that was Rex Brindley. Rex was uh, at the Swinton Chevrolet car lot in Tulsa, Oklahoma. A man saw him looking at the pickup and knew him. And the man was named Don Bolding. Don Bolding's brother was Gene Bolding, the chief of police in Tahlequah. He worked at a trucking company in a different city, and they needed something with a little more gas mileage. So it's ironic that something so simple, so mundane, led to this horrific event. The truck that Rex was looking at uh, with the camper um, was later um, found uh, and being operated by an associate of Rex. And he threatened uh, Don Bolding because Don Bolding went to the authorities after he learned that pickup was stolen and said, I saw Rex Brindley looking at that pickup. Mr. Bolding's uh, was called to testify to place him at the car lot, uh, scoping out the, the truck. Uh, however, be, three days before Don Bolding was going to testify against him, Don Bolding's pickup exploded. Uh, I always opened up around between 6 and 7 o'clock just so I could meet the bread men, the milk men, and pay them. Well, that, that morning, uh, yeah, I was uh, on, on Hickory Street uh, spending the night at my sister's house, which was only about a block and a half, two blocks away. And I was leaning up against one of the checkout counters facing the plate glass windows. And all of a sudden, I heard this explosion. And uh, when the explosion went off, we actually, uh, we thought it was, I thought Russia was bombing us. That's what I thought at first. Looking out the windows, I saw all the debris flying in the air. And the big windows almost came out. I mean, they shook. <laughs> It actually blew out a couple of the windows in the bedroom we were in. I was in buck beds, and it, and it actually, I was on the top bunk, but it actually vibrated me out of the bunk. Brindley's bomb had successfully gone off. But the intended target, Don Bolding, was not at home. I worked for the Soil Conservation Service and had started taking my three kids to the babysitter. And as I was going up uh, First Street, here came a fire truck past me. I was following the fire truck because it was on the way to the babysitters. Uh, when I got to that street, the fire truck turned down. I turned in right behind it and it stopped at this house. And there was all kind of smoke and excitement and everything going down in the backyard. Um, I drove on around to get away from that and I drove in front of the house, made this circle in front of the house to go directly to the babysitter. Um, and when I turned the corner, one of my three children said, oh, mama, there's Miss Bolding. And I said, where, hon? And he said, and I stopped the car, and he said, right there. And the top part of her torso was lying in the front yard. Miss Bolding uh, inherited a family truck uh, to drive back and forth uh, to work. She went out to warm the truck up and turned the key on, and uh, the truck uh, was basically completely destroyed. Her arm was straight out and her face was looking toward her arm and you could still see her wedding ring and her face was just porcelain but it was only the top half of her torso and it just took us by shock and I said oh no 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 that's not Miss that's not Miss Bolding that's a mannequin. Uh, I knew that it was Mrs. Bolding. Uh, and so they were all three crying because my son had had her in class and my daughter had too. The whole town was, the whole community was like a family. It, you know, it was 
people was just, it was more like people were speechless about it, I think, and they, and then it was just like, how dare someone do that, you know, at that point in time? How could someone do that to any individual? The mishap that it was that it was Miss Bowie that, that made it even worse, you know. The worst part of all is in a nice, quiet suburb, little town that I've lived in all my life, you don't expect anything like this to happen. This was one of those things where everyone was kind to each other, everyone appreciated each other. I knew her very well, and, and uh, we had been a guest in their home before. Don Baker and, and the Chief Police, Gene Bowling, and, and uh, maybe Minnie Bowling, and Gunnar Hendricks usually. We'd go to horse sale at Bristol on Monday night, and then she'd feed us usually. And, uh, and then Don and I were Paul Bear at her funeral after he blew her up. And uh, so that was a pretty tense time around here. Nobody knew. Some of the, all the law enforcement, seemed like they worked closer then. Sheriff's Office PD worked pretty good together. I was patrol. And the first time I wore a gun on duty, we, we were Paul Bear and we had them on under suits, the, the, our sidearms. I do remember that. Well, we kind of had an idea who did the bombing. Massively over uh, kill. It was military explosive that um, uh, really uh, amazed most of the ATF agents and everybody else concerned by its strength. Although Brindley was considered by law enforcement and the public as the prime suspect in Mrs. Boulding's murder, it didn't seem likely that charges were going to be filed against him soon or possibly at all. Brindley did have the auto theft trial coming up in April. But as the weeks went by, public perception swayed towards Brindley getting away with the gruesome murder of Fern Boulding. With his top echelon legal team at his side, an over-the-top sense of superiority, and his inherent compulsion to brag about his criminal deeds, Brindley made sure state and local law enforcement knew they'd missed another shot at him. Rex bragged to the uh, OSBI agents. He bragged to them and said, yeah, I did it, but you SOBs can't prove it. He couldn't keep his mouth shut. He was a braggart. Of course, some in law enforcement did send Brindley a message. So he and Hobbs had a hate relationship. Lieutenant Hobbs on high patrol. I remember him Hobbs choking him out. You know, put a chokehold on him like they talk about not doing because of, you know, the, the, some of the death that's happened nationwide. I was holding the vehicle check. I thought I'd harass him a little bit. I went out in front of his club and was holding the vehicle check, checking for driver's license, defective vehicles and whatnot, and Rex would come out of his club, stand up there and holler at me, say some cuss words and whatnot. And finally I got tired of it and just drove my patrol car and he ran inside. I drove my patrol car right up to his door, got out, knocked on the door, and he finally came to the door cracked it open a little bit. And about that time, I just put all my weight into that door, kicking it, kicked the door off the hinges, and the door fell right on top of him. Of course, it knocked him backwards. And so I just got up on top of the door and uh, jumped up and down on it a few times. I said, now, get up, I'm gonna talk to you. He said, well, get off the door, and I'll talk to you. So I did. and. He called the chief's office in Oklahoma City on me, and the chief had me call him, talk to him a little bit, and he just said not to do it in front of the public when you did things like that. But he was seemed kind of glad that I had been harassing him a little. One night I was working, and uh, Tahlequah Police Department called me and uh, said I had a phone call there. If I was close by, I'd come by. And I was, I just down the block from him. So I whipped into the police department and they told me to call Rex Brindley out at his place of business. And uh, I called him. He said, Don, he said, I like you. And he said, I'm just going to tell you something. Right now, there was an individual just came, just left. He said, I talked with him a while. 
and he wanted me to blow you up or a member of your family. And he gave me the make and model of the car. He said he just left just before you called, so he ought to be around the college somewhere. So I zipped up the main street there and saw this car coming. I turned around on him, got him stopped off on a side street. And uh, he had his window down when I walked up there, and I just grabbed him, pulled him through the window, throwed him on the ground, took my pistol out and put by behind his head. I called him an SOB. And I said, uh, did you just talk to Rex about having me or a member of my family blown up? And he would never say anything. And I said, my wife and I, and my wife and you used to go to high school together and you'd blow her up or one of my kids. And he just bawling and squalling. And finally, one of the other troopers, Arlen Scott, found me. He drove up there and talked me out of putting my gun away because I had thoughts of doing away with this individual right there. During that phone call that I was talking with Rex about this individual, contact him, won't blow me up. Well, Rex told me, he said, Don, he said, I knew if I did it, my life wouldn't be worth a plugged nickel because I knew them troopers, every one of them hate me. And I, he said that uh, my life would be over as soon as it happened because they'd come straight to me. Taking into account Brindley's body of work as a hardened criminal, it's more than fair to speculate that Brindley's phone call to Highway Patrolman Fields was an attempt to make Fields think that he owed him a favor, perhaps his life. But Brindley did remark that his reasons for alerting Fields to the murder-for-hire job was self-protection. Not because the murder of an officer of the law and potentially his wife and children was wrong, and informing Fields was simply the right thing to do. In April of 1971, Brindley was found guilty of the Swenson Chevrolet truck theft. He received a four to 12 year sentence and remained free on appeal bond. Friday, June 4th, 1971, was the day many hoped would come. Brindley was arrested and charged with the murder of Fern Bolding. I also remember when they arrested him for the murder, it took a while. Residents of Tahlequah and Bristow were beyond relieved, but were trepidatious at the same time. Brindley's legal team were among the best in the state. Couple that with Brindley's reputation for witness intimidation and elimination, it didn't seem like a victory for the prosecution was all but in the bag. Before the state of Oklahoma could get their shot at Brindley, federal authorities in Albuquerque had first dibs. The U.S. District Court hit Brindley with the charge of alleged falsification of records when he applied to get an airman's medical license with the Federal Aviation Administration. U.S. Marshals took custody of Brindley at the Creek County Jail in Sepulpa and transported him to New Mexico. Many in Northeast Oklahoma were skeptical when it came to the likelihood that the federal and state charges would stick. Brindley had been like a fox when it came to eluding the prison cell many believed he deserved. It's easy to understand the pessimism when you consider the reverse convictions, the utter lack of charges filed, the amount of charges dropped, the complete unwillingness of witnesses to come forward, the failure of six grand juries to indict Brindley, and that every bombing in Tahlequah remained unsolved. The fear was that Brindley, once again, would escape the hangman's noose, and upon his return to Tahlequah, the retribution would be unbridled. This is the absolute terror Brindley had instilled in the people of Tahlequah. This caliber of fear was usually associated with mob bosses and serial killers in major metro areas. Not a short, heavy-set, middle-aged, small-town business owner in a rural state. On paper, it just didn't seem to add up. 
that didn't change the fact that this had happened, and if the federal and state courts once again came up short, it would not only continue, but most assuredly escalate. Plans for an escape before the Albuquerque trial were put into motion. Mrs. Brindley was charged with aiding Brindley in a potential jailbreak by smuggling hacksaw blades into the prison, which were later found in Brindley's cell. Brindley's cellmate, Vernon Cole, later testified that Brindley was in fact planning to escape the Creek County Jail. According to Cole, the plan called for Mrs. Brindley to wait outside the jail after dark and at midnight throw a rope up to Brindley after he had reached the roof, then drive to an aircraft. Brindley would then fly the pair to a ranch in Port Isabel, Texas, then board a boat and stay in international waters for a few months. The final phase of the plan had the couple flying to Chile. The federal trial in Albuquerque opened with Police Chief I.I. I. Weaver of Pryor, Oklahoma, in Mays County, testifying that he had arrested Brindley in 1964 on grand larceny and other charges, and that Brindley had used his Cessna airplane in these crimes. Only two other witnesses were called. Both were medical doctors with the FAA's medical division. Both testified that Brindley had answered no when asked if he had a record of convictions. Brindley's defense asked for a dismissal on grounds of insufficient evidence, which was denied. Upon their return from deliberations, the federal jury delivered a guilty verdict. However, history seemed to be repeating itself when Brindley's five-year sentence was partially suspended. Brindley was ordered to serve a scant six months in prison or a, quote, treatment-type institution and five years of probation. With Brindley's softball sentence in the federal trial, residents in Northeast Oklahoma, and especially Tahlequah, were shaking their heads at Brindley's powers of legal survival. There were only a couple of shots left at Brindley, a federal weapons charge, and the Bolding murder trial, which was next. If the state were to win that case, a life sentence or the death penalty would likely be Brindley's fate. As the Bolding trial approached, Brindley's lawyers had more legal issues thrown in the fire. Brindley was hit with a transportation of a stolen vehicle across state lines charge. Brindley pleaded innocent to transporting a stolen truck from Joplin, Missouri to Tahlequah on December 15, 1970. Brindley's lawyers started by requesting a change of venue for the trial. The location was initially set 30 miles southwest of Tahlequah in Muskogee. Brindley not only wanted the trial moved out of Muskogee, but out of eastern Oklahoma altogether. In the motion filed, Brindley's attorney claimed, the mind of the inhabitants of eastern Oklahoma are so prejudiced against this defendant that a fair and impartial trial cannot be held. This strategy had worked in the FAA trial being moved to Albuquerque. Brindley also received federal weapons charges when a search of his home turned up explosives and a sawed off shotgun. Brindley's law team were successful in getting the venue of that trial moved to Bismarck, North Dakota. This tactic would be employed for the upcoming Bolding murder trial as well. Other tactics used in the Bolding trial were the Rex the victim and Rex the big mouth that was just bluffing narratives. For the victim strategy to have a chance of working, Brindley would need a list of individuals that were out to get him. The more political in nature, the better. Brindley had publicly made his disdain for law enforcement and elected officials well known. Oklahoma Governor David Hall was targeted several times, as was Assistant District Attorney John Russell. Russell was the one that charged Brindley with grand larceny in Mays County. Brindley still held a grudge. During an interview at Western Hills State Lodge with Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation Agents assigned to the Bliss bombing case, Brindley claimed that Russell was the shadowy figure behind the 1969 Bliss bombing. OSBI agent James R. Wilkerson later testified that Brindley told him Russell had hired two men to bomb Bliss. Bliss, who was now an associate district judge, said, I don't know exactly what to say. I don't feel like John Russell did it. Russell simply dismissed the credibility of the accusation. The OSBI didn't buy the Russell story either. Considering the group of shady characters Brindley palled around with, 
a clandestine meeting with the OSBI could get Brinley clipped, even if the information offered was complete nonsense. But Brinley's biggest worry was still the bowling trial, due to either a life sentence or the dead man's walk to the electric chair if found guilty. Initially, the murder charge listed Brinley and three unknown persons, but was later amended to just Brinley. Brinley's tendency to brag had made the prosecution's witness list grow in number. During the preliminary hearing, Graydon Cole, an employee of City Vending Machine Company, testified that Brinley had shown him what resembled a court summons with the name Don Bolding on it and wanted to know if he knew him. Brinley later told him that he had found out where Don Bolding lived. Cole went on to state that Brinley said he was being framed but had a leak in the DA's office and could find out anything he wanted. Also in Wilkerson's testimony, he quoted Brinley as saying, Every time Don Bolding turned over in the night and reached for his wife, he'd know he shouldn't have fucked Rex Brinley. And he'd eventually get Don Bolding after the heat's off. As the trial neared, Ralph Hinkle, one of Brinley's bartenders, was added to the witness list. Hinkle was close with Brinley and was suspected to be an accomplice to the murder. In July of 1971, Brinley's motion to move the trial for transportation of a stolen vehicle out of eastern Oklahoma was denied. The trial was moved to Ada, Oklahoma, where Brinley was found guilty and given three years. With things stacking up against him, the future didn't look good for Brinley. On the other hand, Mrs. Brinley had the escape plot charges dropped a few weeks before the bolding trial began. Prosecutors cited pre-trial publicity and failure to immediately locate a key witness as reasons for the charges being dropped. This only added to the public's concerns that Mr. Brinley would somehow, some way, dodge a guilty verdict. Brinley's legal team was successful in getting the Bolding murder trial moved to a new venue, which was scheduled to begin Monday, November 15, 1971, in Okmogee, Oklahoma. The press flocked to the courthouse, as this was the trial of the year. Brinley's legal team surely had to put on some sort of show, because the case against him was rather stout. Paul Ferguson, the state's number one prosecutor, was leading the state's case. Tensions were high. At one point, Brinley became unglued and shoved a television cameraman. But before the trial had even begun, a key witness for the prosecution, Ralph Hinkle, had gone missing. A bench warrant for Hinkle was issued, yet many believed a hearse was more in order. Although no one in law enforcement went as far as to say Hinkle was a goner, the unspoken consensus was that Hinkle was in a shallow grave somewhere in the Oklahoma woods. Also during the first day, a death threat was phoned to the wife of one of the jurors, and the threat was taken seriously by the court. After the court had gone into recess for the day, District Judge Jess Miracle called the state and defense attorneys for a private conference, warning them not to take the threat too lightly. As the state called witness after witness to the stand, Brinley's despicable, remorseless nature was on full display. Many witnesses from the preliminary trial returned such as Graydon Cole, who stated that three days after the bombing, he was driving Brindley from his bar to his Tremble Street apartments. I was kidding him about whether it was safe to drive the streets of Tahlequah with him because he was being watched by the police. Brindley said he'd give them a flying lesson, like he gave that bitch. Cole went on to comment that six weeks later, Brindley said he had that gal blown up in Bristow. Leslie Steely, a Tahlequah police detective, testified Brindley told him that he knew a lot about the bolding deal. He called it a 70% job. Even if the wrong horse got in the stall, they got the message. He said the people making the investigation didn't know what they were talking about. 16 sticks was wrong, he said. Dick Wilkerson, an OSBI agent, told the court, Brindley told him, I'm going to tell you something about this Bristow thing. He said he arranged the whole thing by telephone. 
He knew how it was done and who did it. And that Brindley boasted he couldn't be convicted because little Rex Brindley was the only one who knew all about it. Phil Austin, another witness for the state, testified he saw a car parked and partially blocking the driveway of the Boulding residence. And that around 2.15 a.m. on the day of the bombing, that the car ahead of him drove off at a high rate of speed with the headlights off. He further added that he noticed one person in the car behind the wheel and said he saw another man get into the auto just before it sped away, causing the tires to wobble. The state contended that the bomb was meant for Don Boulding not his wife. Ferguson also called several other witnesses that testified Brindley had told them he made a phone call up north and had the bombing done because Don Bolding lied about it. Brindley's defense got to work by simply dismissing the testimonies of those that claimed Brindley had knowledge of those who carried out the bombing and that him admitting to it was just Rex kidding around or that the conversations didn't happen at all. They also grilled Don Bolding for an extended amount of time. Brindley took the stand and said he'd never been to Bristow and that he was in Tahlequah at the time of the bombing, that he'd first heard of the bombing when his wife called him and said he was all over TV. Brindley did admit to the 70% comment, but didn't know the intent of it. The climactic point of Brindley's testimony came when he confessed that he had caused the bombing to happen. When asked why, Brindley snapped back to get that bunch of idiots off me so I can get on about my business. At the end of a grueling 14-hour day, Judge Miracle informed all parties involved that he would hear closing arguments Friday morning and at that time give jury instructions. On Friday afternoon, November 19, 1971, the jury retired to begin deliberations after a week of testimony. After fewer than three hours of deliberation, the jury returned. Brindley was found guilty of murder. In instructing the jury, Judge Miracle authorized it to consider the death penalty. But the jury chose a life sentence for Brindley. Uh, by 1971, within a half a, half a dozen years, uh, seven years after he'd become a known criminal, he was on his way to life in prison in the Oklahoma penitentiary at McAllister. Even with the conviction, the Boulding bombing was revisited in a courtroom in 1972 when key witness Ralph Hinkle, whom many assumed had been murdered, was found in Los Angeles and extradited back to Oklahoma. In April of 72, Hinkle pled guilty to explosive possession charges in federal court, which he received a 10-year maximum sentence. Hours after the sentencing of Hinkle, a raid on Brindley's Mays County Ranch was held the search produced a sawed-off shotgun, a silencer, and a tear gas gun. A grand jury indicted Archie Dale Miller, a Vietnam vet, and a former Northeastern State College student as an accomplice in the Boulding bombing, as he showed Brindley how to attach the bomb to Boulding's truck. Miller would later enter a guilty plea. Also indicted was Ralph Hinkle, who had confessed to his role in the bombing before the grand jury. The indictment alleged that Brindley, Hinkle, and Miller practice attaching the bomb. The indictment also said that Brindley and Hinkle took the explosives to Bristow and that Hinkle stood guard with a sawed-off shotgun while Brindley placed two blocks of high-power plastic explosives under the seat and attached the wires. Hinkle also admitted that he and Brindley stole the truck from the Tulsa car lot that led to the Boulding bombing. A week later, Brindley was charged with two more state crimes, theft of a boat and trailer from Wallace Gordon of Tulsa and an automobile from Fred Jones Ford, also in Tulsa. In 1972, Mrs. Brindley would divorce Mr. Brindley. She claimed incompatibility and extreme cruelty as primary reasons for the decision. After the trial location had been moved from Oklahoma to North Dakota, Brindley found himself in a Bismarck federal courtroom to deal with another set of federal charges in April of 1973. These charges stem from the weapons and explosives he was found in possession of after his arrest for the Boulding bombing in 1971. The jury deliberated nine hours before convicting him on four counts of violation of federal firearms laws. Sentencing 
was deferred pending a pre-sentencing investigation. But with Brindley under a life sentence, it really wouldn't have mattered what the sentence was. The roof had finally collapsed on Brindley. Residents of Tahlequah could finally reclaim their town and return to the safe, small town life that, for several years, was put on pause. In 1973, life had returned to normal in Tahlequah, with Rex Brindley being locked away in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister. But a series of events would soon change that. Well, first in Texas, there was a famous federal case that uh, kind of broke up the Texas Department of Corrections. Uh, it started uh, a trend in federal courts and it also uh, gave hope to prisoners uh, around the United States. As a matter of fact, Oklahoma was one of the prison systems where there were a lot of disgruntled prisoners, as you would normally expect, but they had uh, grievances. They had grievances about uh, health care, food, treatment, sanitation, etc. The prison was originally designed to hold around 1,100-ish people, and it was well over 2,000 people uh, in the prison behind the wall at the time. So uh, you have very unsanitary conditions, the plumbing doesn't work, uh, the running water is, is, is a rarity in some spots. Um, it's just a horrific place to be in the early 1970s. There are reasons for uh, incarceration, but incarceration ought to take into consideration that uh, these are people people uh, who, some of them are very evil, some of them are down on their luck, some of them were idiots and just got into trouble because they didn't watch what they were doing. A riot breaks out in the prison. Law enforcement officers are now on the scene here in McAllister. National Guard has been alerted and a few are standing by here. 100 inmates have now joined the revolt and reportedly hold as many as 18 hostages. The rioting inmates set fire to four buildings in the prison's industrial area. The they burned down a lot of the prison. And at the time, it was the most cost costly prison uh, rebellion in American history. They burned it down. There was a guard or two killed. And the prisoners had just taken over. They called in most of the state troopers down there to squelch it. I was left here in the county for a few days, then I went down and relieved one or two of them. And uh, Rex takes advantage of this situation. It was the occasion by which Rex Brindley decided to seek his freedom, and did. Uh, there is part of the prison uh, that is breached, and he finds a roughly six-foot hole and he probably had some help at this time. Um, the, when they found the hole that he was in, there was uh, obviously he just kind of scooted uh, some of the materials on top of it, but uh, obviously there was tin laid on top of it, covered with dirt, uh, burning material, uh, debris from the riot, and that's what he hid in. And when the opportunity arose, he was able to get out of the hole and make his escape. The summer of 1973 found the nation wondering what bombshell was going to drop next in the scandal that had been dubbed Watergate. Was the ceasefire agreement in Vietnam going to collapse? And was raising the minimum wage the right move? But in Cherokee County, the only questions were where the hell is Rex Brindley? 
and who would he kill first? The escape was well documented across a good portion of the country, with sightings coming from various areas across the multi-state region. It was believed south would be Brindley's direction. In a case of mistaken identity, Guilford E. Young of Alabama was stopped in Nowata, Oklahoma, because he resembled Brindley. It seemed Brindley was everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Citizens of Tahlequah were essentially in preparation mode for the seemingly imminent Brindley revenge tour to commence. We were at the lake, um, at the cabin, that, uh, on a weekend after Rex had um, escaped. And I'll never forget um, the FBI showing up and they had their black suits on and there were two or three of them uh, that showed up at the cabin asking uh, my father if you know we had seen Rex or heard from Rex because that could have been a place where Rex could have hit out, I suppose, at Grand Lake. And I just remember being in awe of these guys in their black suits. You know, they looked so official. It was kind of scary. The threats that he'd made while in prison uh, had people in the Tahlequah area, Muskogee, Tulsa, northeastern Oklahoma, uh, pretty scared because uh, they knew that he would make good on his threats. An attitude came over Tahlequah, a fear, because he had followed through on other threats. I, I became aware uh, after the escape of Rex Brindley that he had issued a, a hit list of people that he was presumably, uh, I, in fact, I think the, the threat was he was going to kill everyone that was on the list. And if that weren't the case, it was feared that if he were unsuccessful doing that, that family members could be harmed. And while he was in prison, he threatened his lawyer. He threatened his wife's divorce lawyer. He threatened the banker, Tahlequah banker, that uh, foreclosed on his property. It became a real, uh, a real issue for uh, for my family. Uh, it, it was more fully explained to me the the reason that my, my father was on the hit list because of his uh, the fact he was the president of the Tahlequah Savings and Loan. He was on the board of directors. The savings alone had had to foreclose on an apartment building that Mr. Brinley had on Tr Trimble uh, here in Tahlequah, and that evidently did not settle well with uh, with Mr. Brinley, and he sought to avenge that the transgression that was perpetrated by the Tahlequah Savings Loan by uh, taking my father's life. I, I have I'm been a lifelong sports fan, and so I always went to, to the Tahlequah High School and Northeastern State University football games. My parents lived about a mile away, and so my cousin and I would walk to the games, and I was surprised and, and you know, a bit concerned later when my parents revealed that I was followed, watched, I mean, I was monitored by law enforcement when I would go to these games because of the fear of something like that uh, happening. And I remember in 1973, the year I uh, graduated from law school that Bill Bliss, uh, that Rex Brindley had broke out of prison. And I remember talking to Bill about the extra precautions that were being taken because uh, they were afraid that he might be on the hit list. And uh, Bill was concerned about his family. And, and the smart money was on him showing up and doing some damage, but that's not what he did. What he did was he and these three men fled south into Texas. Uh, they were stopped down there. They got uh, gave fake names and got away. They split up. Garland uh, Rexford Brindley Jr. went to Biloxi, which was the headquarters of the Dixie Mafia. He worked as a plumber, and by all indications, he uh, was a model tenant there. And uh, he uh, rented from a, a couple there and did odd jobs and found a plumbing job. He had developed a close relationship with Mike Gerlich, who was the, uh, who ran that, what they called the Strip. Wide open, wide open place. It was amazing, really, down there on the Gulf. You, uh, I'd been in the military and I'd seen some wide open places, but I was shocked when I saw what was going on at Biloxi. And it turns out that uh, they more or less had local permission to do that. 
And that was a haven. Down in there, you, uh, you could be hidden. You could get money. You could launder money. This girl was the, was the banker for the Dixie Mafia. And uh, that is, I, I believe, the connection. And I also believe, like, the, I mean, somebody from that federal office, most of whom are no longer with us now, they probably have some extensive records on the activities of the Dixie Mafia. And they probably link Rex Brindley with that group. I mean, after all, he didn't follow through on his promise to seek retribution against the people that had imprisoned him like he threatened he would, he went to uh, the headquarters of the Dixie Mafia. There was a, uh, a, a, a silent reward out for him uh, where you could, I believe the re bounty was $5,000, but to this day, the, uh, it is not known who actually gave the tip to the police that led to his capture because he was actually on his way to work and the truck that the young man that was, had gone by to pick up Rex at, at the, his apartment uh, was pulled over and surrounded by police and Rex uh, gave himself up without any incident and brought back to the prison. the summer of 1976, the nation was celebrating the bicentennial with TV specials, parades, fireworks, and a multitude of other outdoor events. Voters were focused on the upcoming presidential election between the Democratic nominee, Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter, and the Republican nominee, President Gerald Ford. One of the biggest, if not the biggest, campaign issue was the gas shortage that continued to plague the nation's economy. Rock fans flocked in droves to arena rock shows. Several summer rock festivals had over 100,000 in attendance, which solidified the 70s as the arena rock decade. And the Duke urged Americans to show some patriotic pride by purchasing U.S. savings bonds. Take stock in America with United States savings bonds. Thank you. Tahlequah was settling back into its pre-Brindley identity, a small college town from fall to spring, and a tourist town stacked with outdoor recreation options in the summer. Worrying about the future wasn't on the city's agenda. The feeling was that Brindley was destined to die in prison. He didn't return to deliver the death he promised when he escaped in 73, and he'll never succeed in busting out a Big Mac a second time. So let's put it behind us. Well, never say never. Wherever Brindley found himself, he made his presence known. He was certainly known to the inmates at Big Mac before his arrival. The rumored ties to the Dixie Mafia, the Italian Mafia, his publicized attacks on law enforcement, and his cold-hearted attitude in regards to Miss Bolding's death gave Brindley the type of image that put him near the top of the food chain amongst inmates. He was an important man within the prison. Rex basically had free run of the prison. He was somebody everybody knew and deferred to in a lot of respects. Even after escaping in 73, Warden Richard Crisp gave Brindley privileges that inmates that didn't escape or hadn't been discipline problems, couldn't get. Brindley had a keen sense when it came to recognizing individuals he could manipulate. Warden Crisp was one of those individuals. He did what he did best with the warden. That was basically conding. Rex, he's a con man. That's what he was, was a con man. He managed to get out of the prison through an underground tunnel, and they were able to cut through at least three steel doors in his tunnel and come up in a manhole and started a multi-state uh, 
manhunt for Rex and these other inmates. With Brindley on the loose again, Tahlequah was on red alert. But so was the rest of Oklahoma and its neighboring states. The FBI jumped into the mix too. It was very clear law enforcement agencies, both federal and state, would not let Brindley slip past them again. The manhunt garnered national media attention, which made Brindley big game. Governor David Bourne provided ample resources to the search. Brindley wasn't getting away on his watch either. It wasn't long before facts began to surface as to just how easy it was for Rex, the reported ringleader, and his crew of prison thugs to escape. Taking into consideration that Brindley was a high profile, convicted murderer and previous escapee with a big mouth, the con job he ran on Warden Crisp was truly his masterpiece. According to Jay Riggs, the top civilian plumber at the prison before resigning, stated that he had orders from Crisp that Brindley was to get just about anything he wanted. A former plumber, Brindley was allowed to work on the prison's plumbing without supervision and to check out any tools he wanted, including cutting torches, hacksaws, and metal files. Brindley and his crew spent weeks working on the escape tunnel without any prison personnel present. Just a few weeks before the escape, Brindley had bragged to a reporter about his plumbing work at the prison predicting that the prison would have the best plumbing history before I leave here. Brindley even dubbed himself the prison's plumbing boss. When pressed about his history of escape and concerns his plumbing work might allow him a chance to bust out, Brindley stated, they don't have to worry anymore. After the way I'm working, I'm too tired to run. Chris, who was on vacation at the time of Brindley's escape, said Riggs's claims were a damn lie by a disgruntled employee sour grapes by a person I've had to reprimand on several occasions because he's been a lazy rumor monger that is detrimental to the state. Chris blamed overcrowding, lack of money, and outside construction workers as the main contributors to the escape. Moreover, Chris was quick to proclaim that several employees would be terminated. The public saw this as Chris throwing them under the bus for his inept decisions and did nothing to alleviate the general fear throughout the state. Even more embarrassing for Crisp was when several previous attempts by Brindley to escape were spotlighted by the press. In July 1974, Brindley was 1 16th of an inch from freedom. He had managed to cut a 14 inch square hole through the back of his cell that was made of steel. A guard searching Brindley's solitary cell while he was out in the yard exercising caught a glimpse of a hacksaw blade that was stuck in the crevice. If Brindley had finished the small cut, he could have entered a hallway that was used for servicing utility lines and made his way to the roof to escape. The search of Brindley's cell also turned up two keys made from ballpoint pen fillers that, when tested, opened handcuffs. In early January 1975, an inmate had to be moved from Big Mac to another facility because he had told authorities about an escape being planned by six inmates. Warden Crisp utilized Brindley's plumbing skills to remodel the execution cell where the electric chair is housed. The informant somehow crossed paths with Brindley's group and some bad blood developed. Brindley's group told the inmate that before they escaped, they would strap him into the electric chair and stab him to death with a screwdriver. The inmate feared this group well enough to reveal their plan. When guards searched the work area, they found that bars and a window had been cut with a torch another Brindley escape plot was foiled. Things just got worse for Crisp when evidence surfaced that prison officials were tipped off about the breakout, but dismissed it as rumor. As authorities began scooping up the fugitives, folks in Tahlequah were waiting for Brindley's name to be checked off the list and were asking themselves yet again, where the hell is Rex Brindley? Back in a familiar situation, several individuals in Tahlequah were given as much protection as law enforcement could spare, given that so many law officers were a part of the manhunt. According to Jim McSpadden, Tahlequah Police Chief Gene Bolding was just scared shitless. Some people said he went up north somewhere and just hid. After a week with no leads, and the likelihood that Brindley was already out of state based on his previous escape, 
the hope of a quick capture dwindled. Even Department of Public Safety Commissioner Roger Webb said there was only a remote chance that Brindley was still in the state. Then something unexpected happened. So unexpected that many didn't believe it at first. It had to be a mistake by law enforcement, a bad joke someone was pulling, a misprint by the newspapers. Canadian Oklahoma is a small rural town 20 miles north of Big Mac and McAllister. That's where C.A. Pierce, a guard at Big Mac's infirmary, who was shopping at Jones Grocery Store, came face to face with a tick-covered, sugar-bitten, dirty, tired, very hungry Rex Brindley. After going outside to discuss the situation, Oklahoma's most wanted man surrendered to Pierce and was driven back to Big Mac where he was admitted to the prison hospital for treatment of several issues, most notably the massive amount of insect bites covering his body. Conditions for Brinley during this escape weren't exactly deluxe accommodations. Since the sky was dotted with helicopters and the roads clogged with law enforcement, Brinley had to stick to heavy woods and thick brush. Heavy rains moved into the area during his escape, which hampered the manhunt for a few days, but was devastating to Brindley's quickly eroding mental and physical status. Brindley was in a war against an opponent he had no chance against, Mother Nature. After he was well enough for questioning, Brindley stated that the getaway was spur of the moment. Of course, nothing indicated that being the truth, or even a half-truth. The truth and Brindley seemed to be at odds from time to time. After convalescing, Brindley was put in solitary confinement. But everyone seemed to know it wouldn't be too long before he'd be back to his old tricks. In December 1976, prison chaplain Bill Donovan reported that Brindley was working on a cross-reference of the New Testament. The chaplain said, Rex shared what he's doing with me, and it's a pretty big project. Of course, many doubted that Brindley had actually found Jesus. That's the chief way to get out of the penitentiary, is claim he found Jesus. So I hope he did, but I don't, he was a con man, I, it's hard to believe, you know. Another dynamic that you see is, I think part of that, that sociopathic dynamic is that they begin to believe all of the things they're telling people in, in efforts to try to convince them of their, of their goodness and their harmlessness and their, their generousness and their beneficence uh, such that they begin to believe that they are actually that way when uh, any, any rational, sane person would realize that they aren't that way. They're, they're a hardcore criminal who is murdering people and th threatening people. But I think the idea is that if they can convince people of what they've convinced themselves of in terms of this ingratiation process, that they're no longer evil, that they're as good as they think they've convinced the other people that they are. When asked about Brindley's newfound activity, Warden Crisp remarked, it sounds like something he might be doing. He has plenty of time. However, time was something Crisp was soon to be out of in regard to his position as Warden of Big Mac. The fallout from Brindley's bicentennial bust out was too much for Crisp's already tarnished tenure to withstand. 
In January of 1978, Crisp resigned. Crisp quickly found employment in Arizona as the Deputy Director for Institutions with the Arizona Department of Corrections. Crisp was to make $30,000 annually, which was $7,400 more than he made at Big Mac. Adjusted for inflation, this equals to just over $142,000 a year. However, just 10 days into his employment in Arizona, Crisp resigned. He returned to Oklahoma and eventually went back to work for the state as director of the Alcohol Beverage Control Board. In 1979, Brindley still had connections on the outside and still harbored a grudge. The lawyer for his ex-wife, Patrick Williams, was driving on a Tulsa street when a dynamite blasting cap attached to the car's fuel tank detonated. The tank did not explode because it was full. Had the tank not been full, the fumes would have ignited, causing the tank to explode. Williams, who had been threatened by Brindley before, said he had a few ideas about who might be responsible. Within the prison itself, he evoked a certain amount of fear. When I was assistant district attorney, Rex Brindley was um, disciplined, arrested, and maybe even prosecuted when they found a loaded 32 semi-automatic pistol in his radio. And um, they, had been, they had gotten word that there was an escape in, uh, in the planning. They shook it down and got that gun and uh, some money and some other contraband, actually. And uh, his uh, excuse was, I wasn't going to escape. That was collateral on a loan that I'd made to another prisoner. The plan was for Brindley and his accomplice to take over the Jack E. Brannon unit, then move on to the eating area and take the food supervisor hostage. The pair would use the food staff uniforms as disguises, wait for the food truck, hijack it, and pass through the prison gates. Brindley was prepared to take the gate by force and exchange gunfire with guards if something went wrong with their plan. It was learned the handgun was smuggled into the prison by a disgruntled prison guard. Perhaps Brindley had decided to drop the Born Again Act and return to his previous set of ethics, or lack thereof. The, the prisoners wouldn't testify against him. He was uh, someone that usually carried through on a threat. During a visit to the prison, Judge Bill Bliss met with Brindley. Brindley told Bliss, they messed up yours and all the others, but when I do it, I have it done right. Brindley did not elaborate further on the subject. As the years went by, Brindley was denied parole time and time again. Brindley seemed to enjoy meeting with the parole board. Not only was it a chance to get out of his cell, but to be a favorite character of his, Rex the con man. In 1991, he had a parole hearing, and it turned out to be kind of a, um, oh, it was a, there was a lot of laughter. He was very frank about this. He may have even mentioned the uh, uh, sorry state of affairs his health was in when he was captured that second time. He was trying to get transferred to the federal system. Uh, they denied his parole 5-0, but it was 4-1 to one as to whether to transfer him to the federal prison. So he had, con he, he was, he had convinced one of the parole board members to uh, put him into a new system. Yet he still found joy in being, arguably, the most notorious criminal in Oklahoma, which helped him maintain his status in Big Mac. During a performance at the prison, Johnny Cash asked, Is Rex Brindley here today? After Brindley waved at him, Cash said, Glad to see you out of the hole. Brindley's escape made the top 10 list in 1973, along with the prison riot that made his breakout possible. And Brindley's 1976 breakout was the biggest story of the year in the state of Oklahoma. For two decades, Brindley found his way into newspaper articles several times a year. As a child, you, uh, in school, your name becomes kind of infamous, you know, like if, if someone meets you or they, they would tease you a little bit about your Brindley name. And I, I actually was questioned uh, all the way up into my 40s uh, by people. When they'd hear my name, they would ask about Rex. It, it doesn't ever happen now. Very rarely does it happen. 
But I've met people randomly that had associations with Rex in some way, and not one of them had one positive thing to say about Rex. The only time I met Margaret was at the ranch, or I think they had a place when, before they got the ranch in Tulsa, and that would be my earliest memory of meeting Rex and the family at that house. And other memories I might have or had meeting Rex and Margaret and the kids was just that um, they just seemed a little bit different to me as a child. My my um, the way I felt was that they weren't as quite as polished as maybe you know. A, we were, I guess, more of a country type family from the country. And, uh, you know, just more countryfied, I guess. We were more of like city kids. Uh, Odine, his mother in law, um, I know, you know, I knew her very well and loved her dearly. Odine um, would tell me stories about Rex that no one else knew, and Rex would come over in his car, pick Odine up and have her drive while he would scooch down in the seat and he'd just be all giddy and tell her all about his girlfriends. And I thought that was odd that he would want to share that information with Odine. He was so opposite of my father. My father was well-spoken. He was like a, a businessman. Uh, well-liked, fun, jovial. He walked into a room, everybody loved my dad. Rex was just kind of like Rex, you know, he was, he was intimidating to me. When the room, uh, when Rex became famous, it was very difficult on my father um, because the name Brinley became well, if you told someone your name after the Rex was convicted, they immediately ask you uh, if you knew Rex. <laughs> and I started just saying, well, he was just my father's brother because he was my uncle. And, but it was embarrassing to see that. I could feel the embarrassment my father had for it and the concern he had for his reputation, being the brother of someone that was so evil. And I want to say uh, up front that I believe Rex diver um, definitely deserved the death penalty. And um, it's a shame that it wasn't carried out because he was evil, and for what he did, he never apologized, he never showed remorse, as if he never did it. And we all know that he did it. Um, and he went to his grave without apologizing to the, the family. I also want to say I'm, I really feel for the family of the, uh, um, for just such a despicable act to um, carry out a, uh, a bombing of another human, especially just a young family. You know, it, law, the loss of a human life is just so devastating, and I can't imagine the pain that that day um, well, the pain continues on to this day, I'm, I'm sure, with many of the family members, of uh, the victim's family members. And I, um, as years passed, I was in communication with Rex occasionally, and he would reach out to me, he would need this or that, and uh, I came to realize that no matter, all Rex wanted to do was manipulate me to get something from me on the outside. And one time he had 
asked me to file something for him for, it had to do with social security or something like that. And it was an unimaginable thing because what I was supposed to do is file something illegal as far as I was concerned. I mean, he's in prison. I think he was just trying to get some money somehow from the state. And that's when I realized he really did not care about me. Rex Brindley died as a maximum security prisoner in a Tulsa hospital, basically from congestive heart failure. As with prison policy, there was an unarmed guard in the room with Mr. Brindley, and outside his door was a guard that was armed. And obviously, his condition didn't allow the possibility of escape. Uh, he, uh, he lived a full life, but half of it, fully half of it, was in a cage. And uh, that's Rex Br Brindley as we knew him, and for only a brief time in Tahlequah, really, but a remarkable time. It was, um, it, it was uh, dynamic, it was explosive, to coin a phrase. It was dangerous. Was he a product of society in this case? Probably not. I just think he uh, was an evil man um, that had no really moral conscience or guidance. And if he couldn't get his way, he found a way to get it, regardless of who he had to hurt. He committed a lot of crimes for which he wasn't punished. I mean, if you say, I'm serving the wrestler special, and it's likely true, uh, you can bet there was an investigation somewhere on one of the more important crimes in rural Oklahoma, cattle wrestling. And yet, he did uh, operate with impunity. Uh, but for some ticks and chiggers, uh, he, would, he might still be out of the uh, penitentiary. He was someone to be reckoned with uh, to his dying day. Uh, from my research and interviews from people that dealt with him directly, um, and the various families that he had a tremendous impact on, uh, even to still today, uh, I'm sure there were no tears shed for the man at all.